reading of the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Amen. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem inquiring, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his stars that rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and rabbis and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you, who will be worshipped as a shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi into a private conference, and he learned from them the time when the star had appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search for the newborn. And when you find him, come back and tell me, so that I may go and worship him as well. After this audience, the king with the king, the Magi, went on their way. And behold, the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when it came time to leave, they returned to their own country by a different route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. My sisters and brothers, the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. celebration this past year. Twelve days is the feast of Christmas, and after the twelve days of Christmas, the church celebrates a very ancient feast, the Feast of the Epiphany, which is what we are observing today. The Epiphany actually falls on the 6th of January, which is tomorrow, but we are celebrating it in anticipation of, of that day. Believe it or not, the uh, Feast of the Epiphany uh, precedes the Feast of Christmas historically as an observance of a feast in the church. Uh, early Christians celebrated the uh, Feast of uh, what they call Pascha or Easter, the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus from the very beginning. And then um, as, uh, as the decades passed in the early uh, Christian experience, uh, the Feast of the Epiphany became the next great feast that Christians observed. Christmas only came more or less as an afterthought. Since we're celebrating Epiphany, maybe we should also celebrate the birth of Jesus. And so December 25th was designated as that date for various reasons, which I will not get into this morning. Uh, so by participating today in this particular Feast of Epiphany, we're getting in touch with something that is very ancient in the Christian roots uh, of, of our faith. So I, I wanted to point that out to you this morning. So when someone says to you, happy epiphany, uh, that will have some meaning to you, rather than, what is that? Um, in Europe, many of the countries of Europe, uh, uh, tomorrow will be a national holiday for them. Uh, the Europeans take very seriously this ancient observance of the Feast of Epiphany. Wouldn't you like to have tomorrow off from work? Yes. Right here, Congressman. <laughs> But it's, it's great to, to be together to observe this wonderful feast. But what does this word epiphany mean? What does it suggest to us? Now, I know my wife gave away half my homily in the introduction <laughs> and reading of the epiphany. It's a short homily here. Yeah, it will have to 
I'm short this morning. But an epiphany is a great moment of revelation when all of a sudden that which is hidden is revealed. Uh, the word to be manifest or to be made known is associated with this word epiphany. In, in common English usage, sometimes you'll hear someone say or you'll read something in a novel or in, in an article that will say, and someone will say, I had an epiphany. And what that suggests is that all of a sudden, they suddenly received a new insight. They saw something that they had not seen before. Unlike most of the things that we associate with the spiritual life, which is a gradual development and evolving of our inner consciousness and, and, and the spiritual life, an epiphany is not something that happens to you gradually. An epiphany comes upon you instantly and suddenly and unexpectedly. It comes to you in a flash of light. It is something that is a gift that is given and imparted to you. You cannot have an epi epiphany left on your own. No matter how much effort you put into your religious life or to your spiritual life, you will never be able to attain an epiphany. An epiphany is something that comes from the divine initiative. It is God through his grace and his goodness that bestows upon you in a moment of time, in a flash of light, a revelation concerning his purposes and the divine will. And so throughout life, we have these experiences once in a while, all too few, in which we have an epiphany in which a gift has been given to us of an insight or a new vision. Something that was unknown to us becomes known. The Feast of the Epiphany is based upon the Nativity account that is recorded for us in Matthew's Gospel. It is about the Magi from the East who come, and we think of them as three kings based upon the three gifts that uh, they brought to the Christ child, but we don't really know how many uh, arrived, even though we have named three of them, Melchior, Balthasar, and Gaspar. Uh, there were probably many others. This was a huge caravan. They were Persians, and they were uh, priests of the ancient religion of Persia, which is called in English uh, the Zoroastrian religion. It is rather unknown to us. It was the religion of Persia. And so these were per uh, Persian sages and wise men and priests who came uh, to give worship and honor and adoration to the newborn king of the Jews. This is a strange story. It's not the kind of story you expect from the Gospel of Matthew. In Luke's Gospel, which is, gives us a very different uh, nativity of uh, account of Jesus. It is the shepherds in the field that come and worship and adore the Christ child. In Luke's gospel, the writer goes to great lengths to say that Jesus is first revealed to the nation of Israel, to the Jewish people. And so all those that respond and recognize the infant Christ as being the Messiah, the one that was expected by the ancient Hebrew prophets, are all Jewish. And yet, interestingly enough, of all the four Gospels, Luke's Gospel is the most Gentile. Because the writer himself, Dr. Luke, who was a physician and an artist and a companion, a missionary companion of Paul, was himself a Greek and not Jewish. But Matthew's Gospel, on the other hand, of the four Gospels, is considered the most Jewish of the four. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the community of Matthew, the Matean community, obviously was a community with a high population of Jewish believers. And so the emphasis and the message seems to be directed, first of all, to those who are Jewish. And so Matthew makes particular note of things that would be meaningful to a Jewish reader. And yet, at the very beginning of his gospel, he tells the story of the Epiphany, in which you have these non-Jews, these people who belong to the wrong religion, in the view of the Jews at that time, uh, came and worshipped the Christ child. This is called the Epiphany because in this story we recognize that Jesus is revealed not only to the Jews and to the nation of Israel, but that Jesus is revealed to all the nations. 
So we find embedded in this story uh, something quite new that is happening on the world scene. For you see, human beings have been divided into so many ethnic and language groups, various cultural civilizations throughout the millennia. And each culture and each society and each ethnic group had their own religion. They had their own religious traditions. For you see, religion has become, in the development of the human race at this time, a totally ethnic affair. My religion I didn't share with anyone else but people who were like me. And this was true throughout the world. Every national group, every cultural group, every language group had their own gods and goddesses. They had their own religious practices. And the religion was something that was restricted by the barriers and divisions within the human race. And according to the Hebrew scriptures, since the uh, confusion of the tongues and languages of men at the Tower of Babel, humanity has not been united, but rather has been deeply divided. And so the religion of ancient Israel could be seen alongside any other ethnic religion. You had to be Jewish to be a participant in the religion of Israel. It made sense. You were born into this religious identity. But with the coming of Jesus, something else happens in the religious consciousness of the human race. Something new is on the scene. With the birth of Jesus, there would follow the birth of the Christian religion, which is the first universal world religion. It is the first religion that makes an appeal to all of humanity and makes universal claims that the Jewish Messiah that the prophet spoke of in ancient Israel was not only to be the savior of the nation of Israel, but would be the savior of all people and all cultures and civilizations. God loves the diversity of the human race. And so you have these magi, priests of a different religion coming and adoring Christ. What a symbolic and powerful story that Matthew places at the beginning of his gospel to send the message out to all his fellow Jews that Jesus is not just the savior of Israel, he is the savior of the world. And oh my, how we have forgotten that in the church. We think of Jesus as being our private personal savior or the savior of our particular group or my particular religious expression. And we forget that Jesus is at work in the hearts of all human beings throughout the world. We are a single unit. We are a common humanity. We are connected one to another. And the faith of Jesus inspires people of every nation, of every tongue, of every ethnic group. Jesus comes for the Gentiles as well as the Jews. The word Gentile is the uh, Latin form of the, or based on the Latin form of the word, the nations. That means everybody else. Uh, the Greeks called it the, eth the, had the word ethnos, so we get the word ethnicity or ethnic group. And so Jesus did not come merely for a particular group, but comes to all of us. And when we think of Jesus, when he said those words in the upper room to Thomas on the last night before his death, he said these words that we often quote as Christians, but I think we quote it to support a false assumption. But Jesus said this, I am the way and the truth and the life. And somehow we have interpreted that verse to mean that Jesus just came for us, but not for those people over there. But that is to misunderstand the intent and purpose of the words of Jesus to Thomas on that night so long ago. Jesus came into the world and he declared to his Jewish audience, I am the way and the truth and the life. And he was saying something meaningful to a Jewish audience. He was saying to them, your highest values, the way, which is an allusion to Torah, the truth, another allusion to Torah, and the life. These are the three highest religious values of Judaism. I am the embodiment of the way and the truth and the life. I have not come to destroy and to do away with Torah. I come to fulfill the Torah. 
I am the embodiment of the fulfillment of the promise of the Hebrew prophets and of, the, of Moses and of all the sacred writings. I am the fulfillment of the way and the truth and the life. But the Greeks had another value, uh, value system. In their uh, culture, in their religious and philosophical development, they aspired to three great values. That which is the good and the true and the beautiful. Those were the three highest values that the ancient Greeks could conceive of, and they applied these values to the one who was behind it all. God is the good, the true, and the beautiful. God is the object of which every human heart yearns after. So if Jesus was speaking to a Greek audience, he would have said, not the way and the truth of life, he would have said to the Greeks, I am the good, the true, and the beautiful. To the ancient people of India who practiced a Hindu religion, they also have their religious practices and devotions. And in this ancient religion, they elevate these three ways of encountering ultimate reality. It's called karma, bhakti, and jhana. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Am I, Tony? Oh, yeah. oh good. <laughs> He's a professor of religious studies, so now I got a good grade, so I'm good. <laughs> but Jesus, if he was speaking to the people of India, of Hindus, he would have said, I am karma. Karma is just not some principle of operation in the universe. I am the personification of karma. I am bhakti, the way of loving devotion. I am jhana. I am the embodiment of the religious aspirations of India. For you see, my brothers and sisters, with the coming of Jesus of Nazareth, we have the fulfillment of all the religious aspirations of the whole human race. This is why it is a great mistake for Christians to bitterly attack other religions. <laughs> for Jesus is at work in other religions too, in a hidden way. He is at work within every human heart. And the day will come when the epiphany will strike like a flash of lightning and the eyes of those will be opened and they will see that it was Christ all along who was at work. Truth is to be found in every religion. And truth is one. And Jesus is the embodiment of that truth. Therefore, that truth that is found in Hinduism or Buddhism or any of the other religions ultimately is an extension of the work of Christ who is the Savior of the whole world. With the coming of Jesus at the first epiphany when the Magi worshipped him and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, we have the birth of the first universal religion, the religion of Jesus. And it's not a religion of exclusivity, as religion up to that time had always been, but it was the religion of inclusive, inclusivity. All are welcome is the message of the gospel. It is for all people. And St. Paul recognized his responsibility as an apostle to bring that message to all the Gentiles, all the nations, to every ethnic group and every language group in the world. And he fulfilled his mission. But we sometimes in the history of the church have forgotten the universality of the message and the invitation of God that is found in Jesus Christ. And that is why we continue to build walls between one another, even within the church itself. I love being with you here this morning because I look out at our community and I see such diversity. Who would have imagined among my ancient Celtic ancestors that I would be in union and worshiping God with this Italian man here? <laughs> or with these Asian people here? Or with these African-American people here? And we are one family. I no longer see, when I look at the diversity in this community, our differences. I see a single family in faith. That's the message of epiphany. We're all one. We share a common humanity, and we have a common Savior. 28 years ago, I was a young, newly ordained priest, and I thought that I needed to start a community of which you are part of here at St. Matthew's. And the reason, the reason I started St. Matthew's is because God laid it upon my heart that 
there are those that are being left out. There are those who are being marginalized, being excluded, being told they're not welcome to receive the sacraments. They're not welcome to come and receive Jesus through the Eucharist. They're not to be included because somehow they fail in their own responsibilities in their own lives. And I was thinking of a particular circle of marginalized Christian Catholics. I was thinking of the divorce and remarried back in 1985. That was on my mind because I knew so many wonderful people who had such a love of God who were divorced and remarried and were being excluded from the life of the church. You see, the church got caught up in the religion of exclusivity. And I realized that the gospel demands a religion of inclusivity and you can't leave people out no matter what their identity or life experience has been. And then a few years later, I began to realize as God challenged this community of St. Matthews that the circle needs to be drawn a little larger to include divorce and remarriage, and we had done that. But the circle needs to be a little bit larger. It needs to include our Protestant brothers and sisters who were denied the right to come to the Eucharist at a Catholic altar. By the way, it's not a Catholic altar. There's no such thing as a Catholic altar and a Protestant altar. There's only one altar, and that's the altar of Jesus Christ. And everyone is welcome at this table, this altar. The religion and the gospel of exclusivity, the gospel of Jesus demanded that we brought in the circle to include our separated brothers and sisters who are Christians and who have faith in Christ. They too can come to and have Eucharist at our table. That's why it blesses me every time Pastor Andy, a Pentecostal pastor here every Sunday, comes up, holds his hand out to receive communion at a Catholic altar. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Only at St. Matthew's, not just <laughs> But isn't it wonderful that we realize that we are united? We, it's the same thing. And then I began to encounter other people who felt marginalized and troubled. Women who felt the call to priestly ministry. And yet because of their gender, were being told, you cannot image Christ at the altar. Even though there's the Virgin Mary who bore Christ in her womb, a woman at the altar cannot bear the body and blood of Christ to the people of God. These women were excluded by virtue of the fact that God's call was upon their life. So we were told, St. Matthews was told prophetically, that we were to broaden the circle to include these women and to recognize their call upon their life, that they too can participate in ordained ministry. Deacon Nancy, will you please stand up? Is she here? No. 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 <laughs> somebody. <laughs> and my brothers and sisters, I am proud that 15 years ago, or maybe more like 12, 13, 14 years ago, this community took the courageous step, even though we didn't understand everything about it, that our children and our brothers and sisters who tell us that they have a certain particular sexual orientation that they were born with, and you know who I'm speaking about. I'm speaking about our friends and our relatives. I'm speaking about my son, who's a gay man. We have been challenged to draw the circle ever broader. And we will not discriminate or treat a second class anyone who is of a homosexual orientation. We just will not do that here at St. Matthew's. I want you to understand that. And I want to refer to that. Because our God is the God of all people. Our Savior Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world. Whether that person is of a particular ethnic group, whether you are Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free, we are all one in Christ Jesus. Isn't that the gospel we preach? That is the message of epiphany. That is the message of the gospel of Jesus. And that's why we throw our doors open and we welcome everybody to come here. And we want them to meet Jesus at this table. And we want them to take their rightful place at this table because you're all welcome. All are included. That is what happened 2,000 years ago when the Magi visited Jesus. It was a statement to all the world.
And that's the message we carry. That's the torch that blazes within our hearts that we hold high and aloft. And we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus because it's the gospel of inclusivity. Anyone want to say amen? Amen. amen.